Hi everybody, um, I'm glad you're here today. On the chair today, I've got Amanda Tambuza. Wow, I'm actually so excited just saying your name. <laughs> anyway, um, Amanda is here and we are going to be speaking about what generational wealth means to her. As you guys know, I've started the series around generational wealth just for my own benefit and, and for the conversation to happen because I think as Black and brown people, I think we can do better for our kids. And this is the reason why I'm doing this. But anyway, if you're here, thanks for following us. And um, like, share, do all the things that people do on social media. Comment so that we know um, if you like this series or not. Amanda, thank you for being here. I am so glad. I'm like a child today. <laughs> it's my pleasure for me. Thanks for having me. It's been, it's been a long time coming. Yourself. I know we've been like threatening each other for a while. <laughs> well, I'm Amanda Dambuza, 43 years old, mom to three children, plus a stepson, so I'm mom to four children. And I'm raising three of them full time and one part time. But it's, it's one of the most rewarding uh, roles in my life. And um, I am a, a wife. I am, I think I'm a good wife. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask we'll ask him on yes, the side but he... yes. <laughs> and um and also i i uh, am I'm an entrepreneur businesswoman uh, awarded which is fantastic because you know a, a lot of a lot of what i do is not about accolades it's it's really about living up my purpose and and, and being able to use my platforms to to change people's lives or to at least help change people's lives um, and and I also have the great honor of sitting on boards, uh, which is a great responsibility. Uh, it's not it's not as cute and fun as it sounds, <laughs> but but it's something that I really enjoy doing because I get to 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 deal with people at a at a very different level of intellect, um, and and obviously the the networks and relationships that you get to form at that. And um, I also do a lot of mentorship. I also have, you know, a, a platform on YouTube called Vastly Sage, where I do the mentorship and I've got a talk show. I am an ex executive producer. <laughs> I, uh, I am an author too, you know, um, I am now in fact, uh, just in the process of releasing my third book. And um, it is called Therefore I Rose. My first one was called Baked in Pain, which was a memoir. And the second one is a children's book called A Brave Girl Named Ayer, and now uh, Therefore I Rose. And I mean, I write these books in Bume because I tell stories and I tell um, my own experiences and share how I've conquered certain things and how I've managed wow. to build a successful and fulfilled and content life. And if someone finds something in it, wonderful. Um, and my children's book is really around how, to, how we can enable our, our, our children to speak up when they're uncomfortable, be it in the home mm. or in the school, and also to enable the caregivers to have the tough conversations. Uh, so, so yeah, I do a lot, that, that's me in a nutshell, but uh, above everything else, I, I relish um, being everything I am to myself. Mm. Wow, thank you for that intro. And congratulations on the third book. I'm really looking forward to I need to place an order, right? There's a pre-ordering yeah. process. AmandaDambuza.com and you just order. That's how simple it is. <laughs> okay. No, no, I promise I will. I will definitely get it. And maybe then you can come back and we can speak about the book. That yeah. would be actually, that yeah. would be great. Yeah. So Amanda, as I said, um, I've started this series around generational wealth just because I've got a, I don't want to say a bad money story, but yeah. I think if I were to live my life again, I would I would do the money conversation totally differently. Yeah. And the reason why I say that it's because um, you know how it was, we got out of varsity, but you are younger than me, so maybe you might not have experienced exactly the same you as have me. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> so so you get out of university. You are a graduate, you get given um, credit cards and overdraft from the banks, and you think you've made it in life. 
Yeah. And what I found is that most graduates um, then end up in the cycle of debt yeah. because it's not conversations that we are we really have at home, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like there's anybody who's taking the time to have these conversations with us. So I've got this grudge, if you want to call it, that says, I would have loved for somebody to have spoken to me about investment and, and generating wealth at that early age. Yeah. So I, I want I want for us to really um you give your perspective on that and, and what yeah. can we do? Well, I think firstly it's it's um you, we it, whilst it would have been great to have somebody talk to us about money lessons at a young age, uh, our parents did not come from that. They themselves never had exposure to to financial literacy of any kind. So mm. it's it's almost expecting something that would never come anyway. Um, I think that the, the conversation is, is how do we change it? And yeah. you, you and I both have had the same experiences. In all likelihood, a, a large majority of particularly black children, and, and I'm not even talking about black women now, just black children, would have had the same experiences. Um, because money is, the, the, there was such negative connotation towards money and about money. Money was always taboo. You don't talk about it, whether you have it or you don't have it. In, in fact, rather act poor than act like you have money because people witchcraft and negative energy, you name it. <laughs> As a lawyer. <laughs> So, so we've all come from, from this fear of money, first and foremost, fear of money, because it is this big, ugly thing. Hey, listen, if the, even the Bible says it's the root of all evil, which I personally do not believe. And I, and I really think that with everything, there's context. And, and I was about to say there's context to that verse. You there's, know? there's context to it. But of course, people take it and use it to further their own uh, agendas and what they believe about money. So I think yeah. we, we, we have the opportunity as, as, as this generation to teach our children because we've got far better knowledge, right? We've got, we've got parents who worked so hard that they did really some of the in most indecent jobs, but they did them just so that some of us or children or their children could go to university or get some kind of education. And education has meant access to knowledge, access to, to, to understanding of ourselves as well. And, and in that way, I feel like we have a, we have a responsibility to, to the next generation to teach them every single money lesson we never had, plus all of the ones we've learned along the way from making the mistakes ourselves. So yeah. pretty much like you, um, I, I, I went to varsity with no money. I mean, <laughs> there was no money, Bume, <laughs> period. Yeah. And you were lucky to have money for lunch, a school way. And, yeah. you know, um, so even when I was at varsity, I hustled really hard. I was one of those who even got a letter of financial exclusion. Um, but I hustled hard to get a loan. And then you know how it is. You get that loan, you have to pay it back. But yeah, when you start working, you are showered by these banks with all sorts of wonderful credit and you really need it because you're trying to build your life, right? But that conversation is critical to start having now. Yeah, no, I can, I can relate to the going to varsity with when there's no money. I was yeah. fortunate enough to have gotten um, a Unilever scholarship fund at, yeah. at that point. And that's how I ended up at varsity. But then there's just the daily leaving of being at university yeah. where you just have to figure out and hustle. And, and I was doing work work at Unilever yes. during my holidays so that I can have then pocket money for the rest of the term. Yes. So I look back and I'm just like, I've been working forever because even at university we during working. holidays, I was working Yeah. and, and I had lost my father when I was first at university. So there was like also this responsibility yes. that you then believe as an eldest you need to take and, yes. and yes. help out and stuff. And and you look back and you're like, oh my God, why, why was I not born from the Ruperts of the world? 
<laughs> hey, you can't wish for things you can't change. <laughs> I know, I know. How about I had a trust fund, Dad? If you had a trust fund, <laughs> trust fund. <laughs> it is actually, it's, it's interesting that we, we, and that's the thing with South Africa, the, the, the beauty and the pain of South Africa is how divided we are along the lines of wealth. Ultimately, that's, that's, that is what is at the core of our social issues and, and our, if, to be honest, even our psychological issues, because historically as black people we were excluded from taking part in the economy in, in a meaningful manner. And, and unfortunately, we are in 2021 and it is still a, a reality and a fact. But there is also a large majority of people's lives that have changed. So we, we cannot bury our head in the sand about that. You and I, our lives have changed. We've, we've learned more, we know more, we, we want more, we deserve more, right? And we are willing to work for it. And, and I do think that, you know, at the back of that comment that you made about you've always worked, you know, I feel the same way um, that ever since, you know, at university, some other kids are only worried about passing and partying. <laughs> we were worried about, yo, oh, I need to be at work at three o'clock, but my lecture ends, at, my lecture ends at, at, at 10 to three. How am I going to get to work so early? You know, so from an early age, you just have constant responsibilities. And, yeah. and it does take away from, from a, a, a big part of our lives, unless we make the deliberate money decisions and money moves such that when we are now in our 40s we can actually just start to breathe a bit and relax <laughs> be like please no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but with all these responsibilities as you said it you were the first born you wanted you had to live up to a certain you know responsibility and and perception i guess um yeah. And that's something that never leaves us. Uh, and, and I'm the last born, but I had similar responsibilities because mm -hmm. if you have mm -hmm. siblings that are not succeeding and you are succeeding, you know, uh, someone is, is expected to carry the tribe. Yeah. And, and it is what it is. I think as you get older, you decide to put up boundaries and do all these other things. And it's up to you how you can decide to, to do those things. Yeah. So, what are, so what are the money lessons that you believe we should be bringing to, to the fore? Yeah. And, and mainly, mainly to the professionals, because yeah. those are the people now that are earning. Those are the people that are getting into, into the workspace and they've got money. Like, yeah. what are the initial things that you wish you, you had been taught even before you started work? So I think, for, for, let, let, me, let me, just before I come to myself, I think one of the things we need to do as a Black people is observe our relationship with money and, mm. and what money means to us because mm. it's something that we are very uncomfortable about. And mm. Bume, when I see you, uh, the first question I'm going to ask you is, are you making money? <laughs> you must just know that I am that person that I, I want to know, are you making money? Are you happy? Are you, are you, is everything well with you? But I don't yeah. shy away from the conversation about money because it is, in, it is in us opening up about our attitudes towards money and our relationship with money that we can start to actually deal with what's sitting inside of us about money. Because ultimately yeah. that shows up in everything we do. So it's about observing your, your relationship with money. Um, for me, I had, a, I had a, a, an upbringing where my, 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 okay, my father didn't want anything to do with me because I didn't turn out to be this boy that he was hoping for. And they went their separate ways. And my mom also left um, when I was barely a year or two um, and left me with extended family. And so, and, and the conversations, and I mean, she left me and didn't come back for years. I was introduced to her. So I wasn't raised by her. And the conversation when I asked, you know, about why you, you know, you were not there and all the, the, the subsequent uh, uh, things, the bad things that happened to me without my parents' nurture and protection, the, the, the answer was always, I couldn't look after you. I had to go find work. And so for me, the, my relationship with money was, was such that 
money took away my parents from me. So my oh. money took away my mother from me. Money uh, enabled an environment where I was abused. Money did, so, so as a result, I told myself from a very early age that I was gonna do everything I could in my life for not a single person to own my destiny. In that, in, at that time, I, I didn't have the sophistication of the words to think that it means that, you know, I wanna have money so that I'm not dependent on people for things. But I had to check my relationship with it because I was, um, I, I probably remain highly wasteful um, but <laughs> the beauty of, of where I am now is that I'm a little wiser and I'm aware of it. Um, and when I say wasteful, I have got such a, I've, I've come to appreciate what money can do for me, but I'm also that person I will give to strangers. Like I'll just, my husband is always like, why would you do that? You know, why would mm. you do that? Think about this. So I also have to think about, because I did it, it's almost a, if I have to explain it, it's like, ah, man, you know, like it's just money. You know? It's just money. Yeah. It's just money. And that was always my, my relationship with money. It's just money. And, and even now in my 40s, I'm, I think the lessons about money never go away. You are constantly learning something because they're such deep seated, you know, drivers of, of our relationships with money. So, so yeah, I learned those, those hard lessons, but they were driven by, it's just money and I would make it again. And, and I think the worst people are those people who, who are high achievers, and you mentioned professionals, who are high achievers, who always have access to money. And so what I mean by access to money, you can call a bank and they can increase your credit card limit. It's you that can, more than yeah. just, yeah. Right? And that's how you keep trapping yourself into that cycle because it's not just about the fact that you are upwardly mobile. So meaning that the, the banks know they're gonna keep making money from you because you'll keep rising. And as you rise, they keep increasing and increasing. But also I think mentally and psychologically, you get this bloated sense of self because everyone is throwing money at you and you think life is about money and you think life is about, uh, and, and I wanna talk about when I say life is about money, life is critical and money is critical in life. Critical. But there are so many other things that have to define you as a person outside of money. So, so the lessons came hard. It's the credit cards, it's the overdraft, it's the, actually not just, well, it's multiple credit cards. And then it's cars, changing cars every, I was that person every 18 months, two years, I have a new car. I didn't buy cash, it was all on debt. And, and yeah. you know, and you're constantly trying to, to keep up with this, even if it's not keeping up with others, but it's keeping up with this idea you have in your head of, of what success means, right? Yeah. But in that moment, you're forgetting that you, you, will, you will have children at some point, you will grow older at some point. And, and in fact, money lessons should be, let's just say money moves mm -hmm. start right from when you start working. Yeah. And the one thing I can say I did well um, was put away 10% of my salary when I started working. I used to earn 3,500 that. And I put away 350 rents towards my retirement annuity. And that's probably the only wise money decision I made in my 20s. <laughs> when it On just started. <laughs> It's the only thing. And, and to be honest, a friend of mine who was a financial planner said I must do it. I was like, oh, okay, I'll do it. It's not like Amanda was like so wise and goes out looking for financial advice. No, <laughs> but at least I did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, because, because I think that that trap, I, I, that's where I come from. And, and, and that for me, I take it very personal that the debt trap is so unnecessary and we need to do better. I think our kids need to do better. Um, but, but at the same time, and this is what I find, I'm finding with myself, is that as I've worked so hard to get myself out of debt, now I'm scared of debt. And yeah. I know there are parts where debt is actually not a bad thing, you know? Thing. Yeah. It's a good thing, but 
yo, just having to fill those forms, I'm like, mm -mm, it's why? <laughs> it's terrifying for me and I can feel it in my body. Yeah. Like yeah. I get these palpitations and chest, my chest closes down on me because the only thing that's sitting at my head is like, is squarely to be lazy. Yeah. You are yeah. going back in there again, you know? And, it's and, and, and I, I'm trying to shift that mentality of, but this debt is for creating yeah. Yeah. something else. So it's not coming from a waste, if you, wanna, if you wanna call it that. And that's the only time debt should be acceptable. It's when you are going to create with it, when there's gonna be a return such that the interest that you get charged does not feel so heavy and you're not trapped in it. But of course, there's, there's always risk to that as well, right? So it's, it's about understanding how you can get the best, uh, um, the best value for, your, for, for the money you're borrowing. So I, I always, I mean, I, I did cash out. You know, I said I started really good. I, I oh, the retirement, I knew it, you cashed it out. I did cash out <laughs> from the pension, my pension fund. I had, I had an array in the pension fund, but the pension fund, because array, you can't cash out. The yeah, you can't cash fund, out, yeah. Pension fund, I know, shame. <laughs> and, and, that's the pro, and that's the thing of every time you resign, you then cash it out. And every time you resign, you cash it out. <gasps> exactly. But, 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 you know, and I was that person, but I took out money to start businesses, to buy, you know, a house. Um, so there was always a, a, a reason why I was taking out the money. But to be honest, I would probably say that um, it's, I, I would still advise it if somebody was going to be starting something with it and they, they had a clear vision of what they were going to do with that money. So get the debt if you need it. But honestly, the kind of debts we are talking about here that's a really bad debt is when you are supposed to bail out people, you know? Yeah. Using, I mean, I was that person who would go borrow money from the bank just so I can bail out other people, either yeah. my siblings or my mother. And and I just, I just owe a boyfriend at the time when I was so young and stupid. <laughs> so... Nah. <laughs> nah. So, so you learn these things and, and our job is to make sure that we don't pass on those bad generate, bad habits to, to our children. So, so what, what do I typically do? Uh, things that, that, that are very important to, to me is, um, firstly, I, I understand that trauma, that debt trauma, you know, when you've kind of taken yourself out of it. I think what you start feeling is, oh my gosh, what if they reject me? You know? <laughs> I think you start fearing rejection and, and then because oh, applying for debt is traumatic, hey? And, and then you start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm getting myself back in it again. And, and all these guilt things that you feel. But, but I think it's so important for us to confront our, our attitudes towards money, our mm -hmm. drivers towards those attitudes, and also to start teaching our children basic money lessons. So the things that I teach my children is, I mean, our children get, get allowances these days. That's, that's the life we've been able to build for them. We can't go ahead and punish them for having a good life that we've worked for because we want to yeah. break down this generational stuff, right? So, yeah. so we give them money, but I think what we should never lose sight of is the values around money. And mm. with my kids, you have talent, Come, let's go. You all do wonderful art, paint, paint, do your beautiful artwork. Mama's going to sell it. So mm. I teach them how to use their hands to earn money, to earn a living. Mm. And then I take mm. that money, we go, uh, I, I put it in, into, well, obviously get paid into their bank account. But we then go and I said to them, okay, this is how much you make. This is how much the, the, the materials cost. So this is your profit and your profit yeah. is in your bank account. And when they want something to say these birthday parties that are back again now, <laughs> since we're in level one, gee, yeah. Was... Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. It's just like, and, no. and you can't say no because they feel like they've been so locked up. Exactly. But at the same time, I keep going, 
There's still COVID, you know. That's my line. There's still COVID. <laughs> Maybe level one, but there's still COVID. But anyway, so so when does a when does a, a a gift to be bought? I don't just take them to the store and use their card. No, I take them to the ATM machine and I say, okay, uh, you're gonna buy a gift. What are you thinking you're gonna buy? Let's say, for example, the gift is gonna be a thousand rand or five hundred rand. Take out that cash. And then I show them on the receipt. I say, okay, so you see how much you had? Now you've taken out this money. There's less money in there, which means you're gonna have to work again to get the money in here. Even though we put in money every month, I don't even talk about that money to them. I talk about what money they are able to make. And then when it comes to talking about the money we put in their accounts every month, I tell to that that is linked to the chores in the house. That is linked to, I don't go to the supermarket and come back with scores of bags for you to eat and expect me to still unpack the bags or expect CC to unpack the bags. No, it's your yeah. job. Isn't it? So there's things that they have to do around the house to earn that money. And, and I think it's so important to, to teach them the value of earning money, but also as you are spending the money, understand that it keeps going down to spend it. Yeah. And if you're not putting in more, so that's the value of earning the money. But also it's about what the money can buy. So my kids have earned quite a lot of money through their, their art. And I mean like a lot of money. That at our last vacation, I told them, okay, you are going to pay for your own business class tickets to vac- on vacation. Oh, wow. Vacation. For real, I'm like, this is, okay, some of that money, obviously, it's also the money we, we invest in, in it for them. Yeah. But I said, that time you made, I think they must have made, like, uh, they made a lot of money in Pune because <laughs> they are really talented and they were quite, you know, at the peak of their uh, creativity. And so I've taken some of that money and we use it for vacation. And then we, I said to them, see, you work for money, you make the money, it, you, you can buy nice things about with the money, vacations with the money. And we teach them about credit. We teach them about bad credit and good credit. So all of the things that we've, we've learned, but at the core of what I teach my children is that money buys them freedom. Is that yeah. if they have money, they never have to be stuck in anything, be it a job, be it a a, a place they don't want to be at, whatever, you name it, they have the freedom to do whatever they want to do. And it's not just about saving money, it's about investing money, because that's how you really build generational wealth, not in saving, it's in, in investing and having the money at work. I'm, I'm always like, my money must work harder than I do. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because I think you. I've, done I've done the hard yards so yeah those are some of the lessons that we teach the children yeah because they, they're working hard and and let's be real working hard does not necessarily make you money no no and in, because in, because there are people that don't work hard that make money there are people yeah. that work hard but and, still don't make money it's just like yeah you know money equals money Work yeah. equals money in some shape, way, or form, but the hardness of it, and the and and the hard part traumatizes me as with Amanda. Yeah. yeah, it really traumatizes me. There's a part of me that says, "I know I need to work, but it needs to come with ease. I don't yeah. have to battle. I don't have to yeah. struggle." And and that's the one thing that I keep teaching my kids: like, it needs to happen. Yeah. But it mustn't be like this thing that you end up hating because you're thinking I'm working so hard, but yeah. the money is not, it doesn't yeah. equate. You know yeah. what I mean? And you grow resentful. Um, that's the and, thing. And that's important. I, you know, people, I always say, especially professional, someone is like, oh my gosh, I've got this job, you know, it's such a great opportunity. I'm so excited. And my first question is always, okay, so we already know you're going to work hard because that's what we do, it's given. Uh, how much money will you be making? How much mm. shares are they allocating? What's your sign-on bonus? What, you know, all of the things that, unfortunately, once you've accepted a job, you can't then go back and say, Ish, can we talk again? Can <laughs> we back check? Change clause three. <laughs> <laughs> nope. So, so 
it's given that we, we, we are going to work hard at some point in our lives. I think that that's a fact when we are still building. And, and sometimes, and, and I mean, I don't know you, if you can think back to your, to your initial jobs as you were climbing up the ladder and really hustling. Um, I don't necessarily believe that we, we were ever driven, uh, you know, to, to I, th I think we just needed to work, you know? Yeah. It's like, I just need to work. I need a job. And if you enjoyed what you were doing, that was wonderful. But ultimately, yeah. you just needed a job to earn a living. And, and I think the more upwardly mobile we get, and, and, and you know, you ask the questions to, to, about the professionals, the more upwardly mobile you get, the more you should be so clear about what you enjoy and what you don't. And it is that to, to, to I, I don't work hard anymore. Let me just say that. I do a lot of things. Some days the effort is a lot, but, you know, there's hard work that you enjoy as well, right? It's not, it's not torture. It's not a chore. It's not, it, yeah. it's really something that you're willing to pour your heart into. But ultimately, we all don't work for charity. We don't work for peanuts. We have got to make money. And what I'm finding with professionals is not all of them think about the times when they're not going to have that job. And professional mm -hmm. people like to think that they will always have the job. And unfortunately, we've seen it. Uh, I mean, I, I think the, the, the pandemic just really exacerbated something that's already been there, where jobs like the jobs are getting lost, companies are downsizing. So there's a, there's a whole lot of reasons. But professionals and corporate lives, you know, you get fooled into thinking that you have money because every month you get the money. But how many can actually say? I can stay without a job for six months and survive. And, and that's because, first of all, too much debt. You know, you know what, how we are. The more money we make, the more problems we create. That's just, unfortunately, a, a, a thing about the, our attitude towards money. That comes from not being taught anything about money. I don't believe yeah. anyone should, should, should torture themselves and not live their lives. If you want a nice car, buy it. If you want a nice house, buy it. Just be be so careful about how much debt you are taking on and how much that debt is costing your future. Um, and, and also boundaries around family and this expectation that we must bail out people out of poverty purely because you are the successful one, purely because you're the one that made it. You know, let's say to people, if, if you, you're feeling guilty that you have to, um, keep giving to siblings, extra family, extended, extended. People don't even care about you, don't even know about you. But the, the day they hear you got a decent job, they're the first ones to phone you. You feel guilty because that's your family. I'm like, unfortunately, what that guilt does, it takes away from your future. And so mm -hmm. every time you take out money to give to people who are not working for it, who frankly, you are creating a toxic dependency by keep giving them money that they're not working for, you're yeah. essentially telling them you don't need to work. I'll keep giving you money, and and I'm not talking about giving money to someone who's gonna go start a small spazanyana or something. I'm talking just keep giving money to people for food for this. They, at some point, that everything you are giving to others is taking away from your future. It's taking away from your retirement, which means if you don't have enough money to retire, and it's a fact, it's known, it's out there in the public a lot of South Africans, particularly black South Africans, do, and, and I'm gonna zone it down to black women, we don't have enough to retire. So we end up working well into our 70s and 80s, and, and well, not 80s, so, so cool, no boko, at 80s, but <laughs> well into our 70s because we don't have enough money to retire. So, and also if that job is gone tomorrow, I, how are you gonna survive? You know, and, and I think that is so important for, for professionals to start thinking, to force it into your monthly habits to put away cash and invest it. Not put away some small amount and, 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 and save it in your checking account. No, I'm just saying take money and, and, and however your, your threshold is, but force it, stretch the limit and put it into an investment account that will yield proper interest rate, a, a proper return. I mean. And, and then that money will just keep growing and keep growing. And once you get into the discipline 
So it's almost that concept of pay yourself first, put that yeah. money first. And once you get into that discipline, everyone who asks, Auna money, pen, you, your money is gone now. <laughs> so so you, you can't keep thinking you have an abundance of money because it's in your check account and you're holding it. That money flies by so quickly. So mm -hmm. I really think that that's one of those things. And, and generational wealth creation is not about how much money you have now. It's about how, how best you plan for the future and how best you plan for the time that you are no longer here. Because mm -hmm. you might not have money, lots of money to hand over to your children now, but you can start buying them unit trusts now. You can, you can, you can put away 500 rands per month for, for them or 200 rand, however little, and you start building up. Think about it, if you start when they're born, by the time they're 21, this money would have grown. And as you make more money, you increase that. Similarly to your own retirement uh, uh, situation. But above everything else, if you have children, and by the way, I'm not a financial planner. I'm not certified to get, give advice. People must go and seek advice from professionals. Yeah. But the yeah. one thing that's a fact of life, if you have dependents, you have got to have a life cover. Because what the life cover does, it enables your family to carry on long after you're gone. The kids can yeah. continue to go to school. They, they can have a little bit of a nest egg to start their own businesses when they are older, you know? And, and it's just enabling them financially, something that we never had. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, and, and, and those are valid things, which are things that, because what happens is that we get given, we get spoken to about funeral covers, we get spoken to about savings accounts. Yeah. And those are the things that are in our faces and that's what our parents used to know, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and now I think there's a responsibility on our side. Goba Pella, we've been to university, can't you, why were they, like, why did we go oh. there? <laughs> and then, I know, I know there we, we were not taught some of these things. Yes. But now we've got an opportunity to take the responsibility ourselves to go explore, to go find yeah. out the information. Yeah. And then we can decide whether that's what you want to do or not want to do, right? Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And, and it, it becomes one of those of what are you, what is your vision for your own life more yes. than anything else? Because sometimes you might think, I don't have kids. Why must I even be thinking about this? Which I think is a valid conversation. Exactly. But the minute you've got kids, I think we all don't want our kids to go through what we went through. Yeah. yeah and, it's about, and it's about, if we're talking generational wealth, it has something to do with the generations that are coming after you. So, so you may not have kids, but maybe you have a little sister that you look after. Maybe you have, you know, maybe you have, uh, you're an aunt, maybe you, you know, whatever role you play and the people who are financially dependent on you. And I'm talking about the people you have chosen to look after. You know, there's yeah. always that conversation about when you're gone, you know, who's gonna take care of them. And, and but, but having said that, um, I think what I've, what I've now found, and because you know, my business, which is uh, the project management business, um, we, we hire a lot of people for client projects. And I can tell you almost one, um, let's put it this way, four out of five people that we interview have got bad credit scores, bad credit wow. records, judgments, you name it. So, there is a level of understanding that people have gone through a really difficult time with COVID. But what has happened is people who are also still earning some kind of salary have decided they're gonna abandon their responsibilities because, well, it's an opportune time to do it. What is, hap what is happening now with that, unfortunately, is that those people cannot be hired by certain companies because, for example, banks and insurance companies, any financial services company will not hire people with uh, uh, judgments or bad credit reports because it's 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 a financial services company you're going to be dealing and it's risky it. it's a risk it's yeah. so there's, there's a whole lot associated with it so i think that people are being very short-sighted 
in, 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 in how they handle uh, their own financial affairs. So even those who, who may be in a, who, if you're in a position to pay your debts, pay it. And if you are not in a position to do so, negotiate with your creditors and say, listen, can I have a payment arrangement in place? The minute I get a job, I'm going to be able to. And I'm saying these things because these are things that matter, that even if you actually want funding in your business, you can't get it because <laughs> your credit score is a director or the, shore, the, the person who's gonna hold surety is, is, is messed up. So these are all the things that impact how we set up our financial future, be it for ourselves or, or, or the next generations to come. Yeah, that's a very valid point. And I think a lot of people either do not know or they take it for granted how their financial record and credit scoring and all these things really impact your life moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Wow, not being able to get a job because of your bad credit or financial um, score is actually quite bad. It's, it's, it's disheartening though, because some of these wow. people have got the skill, they've got the experience, but you're like, the client's like, no, we can't touch those people, you know? And, and, and likewise, and, and now I'm, I'm just like popping out of the lane for a moment. Likewise, criminal credit, like, uh, criminal scores, you know, criminal, yeah. uh, uh, we do, when we're gonna hire people, we do credit checks, qualification checks, criminal checks, you name it. If any of these checks come back negative in any shape or form, it doesn't help your financial future. So everything you do every single day, even if you are at that bar and you find yourself in the middle of a fight, uh, exit quietly. Because when the police come and arrest everyone and you have a record against you, you it's harder to explain it when you're trying to get a job, right? So yeah. there's so many things that are so linked to this conversation around generational wealth. Because if, if, you, if you put yourself in positions where you end up being unable to even get a job or start a business in some shape or form, you are impacting your life and those coming before, behind you. And you are impacting whatever little future you may have, right? So I think we, we, when we talk about money and generational wealth, it can't just be about just cash only. We have to understand all of these implications um, that impact our ability to even generate cash to, to build that future for our children. Yeah, no, I, that's a very valid point. I think what you're raising is valid. And we just go on with our lives um, without thinking about these things. You know, those people that are found drunk, driving, and, and something that's small, and sometimes you think something that's stupid yeah. might really cost you a lot. And you, yeah. don't even, you don't even realize at that point in time. Yeah. Because it's all about having fun and vibing and and the yeah. thing you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. it can cost you dearly dearly actually but we've wow. learned our lessons about money and uh, i can safely tell you now for me and i'm sure i mean we probably gonna tell me we're running out of time but um i can tell you that there are so many lessons that we went through that the next generation doesn't have to go through you know, yeah. they, they don't have to repeat those mistakes because we've gone through them. We can teach them about them. We can transfer that knowledge to them. And also though, I think there's a, the world has since shifted as well. I, I tell my children that I don't want them to, to, to make money just so that they can buy a car. I'm like, why? You don't need a car. There's Uber, there's us, we can transport you everywhere. You don't need a car. You know, when we were when we were working, there was no Uber, you know, so you you had to to be able to get to work early, you needed to have a car. And they don't need that, you know. And two, even even I'm I'm still I'm still of the opinion that they don't need they don't need to buy homes either, you know, not so unless. I mean, I don't know, unless there's some really like valid and wild reason, because I'm thinking they need to go out there, leave the country, go get a working experience elsewhere. Come back if you want to come back. But the beauty of generational wealth and, bring, and breaking down uh, uh, its financial barriers is such that our children have choice. 
so they can go and live elsewhere and experience that life is actually more than just this little dot called South Africa or this little dot called themselves. That is a world out there that is waiting for them to experience. And then they yeah. can come back, of course. And we hope that the government creates you know, a, 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 an environment within our own country such that our children go and come back and choose to come back. But, but yeah. ultimately it's um, teaching them that they don't have to rush to get to these things. And property, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm invested in property heavily so, but, but that for me, I do it so that my children have somewhere to go when they need a place. So yeah. they can go use an apartment there, an apartment there without having to strive so much just for rent. And then they're stuck in things they don't like because just then they just need to earn money for rent. I'm saying chase your passion, find your passion. You know, you talk about, work, you don't want that resentful relationship with work. So if they chase their passion, if money is no longer a factor, if, if having a place to stay is no longer a factor, if you don't need a car, that means you probably have much more freedom to chase your passion than just take a job for the sake of taking a job, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that's a very good point because what, what I find a lot with the clients that I sometimes deal with, is people being stuck in those jobs that they hate that on a Sunday they've got like this sick feeling yeah. of I don't want to go to work on Monday but what is keeping them there is but I don't have the six months that Amanda is talking about and I need I've got bills that I need to pay which I fully understand but but my thing is always what's your plan so how yeah. do we plan that you can get to a point where you've got those six months or yes. whatever months of, of extra so that you are able to leave this environment and go and do what you believe you want to yes. be doing. Yes. Because there's, there's nothing, as, we spend a lot, like there's a stat that says an average person spends 90,000 hours at work in their lifetime. 90,000 hours is a lot. That's a lot of hours. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> And in those 90,000 hours, you yeah. better be doing something that you like. Sure. I'm thinking you're yeah. unhappy and you are resentful and you don't enjoy your life. And, and I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a very important question that you ask them because wealth doesn't create itself, you know? Um, yeah. And, and, and bad financial habits develop just as much as good financial habits develop. It's what you habitually do every day. It's what you deliberately decide you're going to do. So one of the things I do, I still do that now. I take out, like I, I, I have a debit order of a large chunk of money that must go out of my account. And once that amount is gone, I then have to be able to live with what's left in the account. But that's it. That's a habit. That's, a, that's something that you have to do. It's a discipline to say, I'm not going to then go and run after the way the money has gone and try and take it out again and bring it back here. Because then it yeah. means you are living way beyond your means. So try and whatever money is, and you cannot skimp on it. You cannot skimp on it. You have got to dedicate every month, this money must go out first. And then yeah. whatever I need to do, I need to do from this money. And if you don't have it, wait until the next month. And, and, and that's a problem. I think we, our, the part about patience when it comes to money is not something we learned. And it's, it's, um, they, we, we might be thinking this generation is a generation of, uh, I want it now. No, we, we were that. That's how we ended up in so much debt. It's because we're not willing to just wait for three years and save up for that car or save up for that house. We want it now because we are working now, we must be seen to be successful. And, and I think patience is such an important thing um, when it comes to money, be it your investments or be it redeveloping healthy habits with money. You have to be patient, but nothing will happen unless you decide to act and deliberately do so. And, and you will see it gets better with time. And five months down the road, you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, I actually have been able to put away that much money. Even though it yeah. gets hard when you eat, it's really hard. And I, you know this, Pume, especially when you're trying to cut down debt. It gets very hard 
because then you have to sacrifice a lot of things and take money from one place and pay off, but have a clear financial plan. And that's what uh, professionals are there for is to help you, you know, develop a healthy financial plan and hold you accountable to it. They hold you accountable. Yeah. But above everything else, yeah. you must hold yourself accountable to it because when we look back on our lives, surely we should be looking back with great pride of the, at least the lessons we've imparted onto the next generation and leave them a bit of money, please. Can we just, <laughs> <laughs> and some strong values linked with that money because they can wow. grow in an instant if there are no values. That's, and, and that's the thing, it's, it's finding that balance of, Let's teach them the money values and, and they create their own money values yeah. so that we also don't, we're not turning in our graves and going, oh my God, this child is wasting my money that I work so hard for. Yeah. But it's no longer yours when you've left it, left it for them. I know. <laughs> but I think that part, that part, I think I, I'm going to be that one who hover around and go, what the hell are you doing? Why are you wasting the money? <laughs> On a roll from the grave. <laughs> but you know, that's the other thing. Just uh, before we close, I, I, uh, I, my husband and I, again, having a will has nothing to do with how much money you have. It is so important to have a will because when you are gone, people like vultures, they come for everything from all walks of life, from all fronts, even people that never existed suddenly pop up because there's, there's some money to be had. So your will is one of the most critical things in life. And I yeah. will ask about ruling from the grave. I mean, my husband is that person that wants to go down to, if this happens, therefore the money will not go to you. If this happens, if you do this, I'm like, sure. Okay, wait, 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 you know? So, so you have got to put in the hard work as a parent as in as far as the values are concerned. So yeah. if you- And that's them, all that you can do the- That's all you can do. If you've taught them yeah. the value of money, so how to earn it through their passions, understand how you, you can easily lose money. And you know, that, that basic lesson of, you won 500 rand for a gift, you had 5,000 rand, now you only have four and a half thousand, which means yeah. the next time again for another birthday, you take out another thousand rand, you now have three and a half thousand. So you yeah. need to keep replenishing where you, where you take. And I think those lessons, and we can't punish our children for having a good life that we've created for them, but we have got to. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what we do, especially black parents. We're like, yo, these kids don't know suffering like I did. Why must they suffer? You already suffered. Why must they suffer? Teach them. That's what we are here for is to teach and guide. And then when we're gone, we're gone. There's nothing more we can do. <laughs> yeah, no, true. And there's nothing more we can do after that. We would have done our part. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for, for the time. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Where would people find you on social media? I am Amanda Dambuza, Amanda Dambuza on Instagram. Uh, I'm only active on Instagram. I am not on Facebook because a lot of fake accounts exist there that claim to be me and scam people. I'm not there. I'm only active on social media and uh, on Instagram as well as LinkedIn. And then the okay. occasional Twitter account, I'm there too. I think it's okay. Amanda, Amanda Scott Dambuza. But if you want to yeah. engage with me, engage with me on Instagram. I'm very active. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you for the time. I really highly appreciate. And for anybody that has been watching us, please leave us a comment and share because I think I think these conversations are amazing. But anyway, that's me just saying. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Pune. Thanks. Thanks.